I left um, presentation in 1953 after those three years. I, um, my mother died in 1948, which was about a couple of months before I entered college to bring glory to our family. You know, I said, why is life like that? You know, she would have been so proud, a son going to college. But she had spent about a year in the St. Anne's institution. And when she came back out for about two or three years, we had three more babies. I don't know where they came from, but we had three more. And um, we even lost one. We didn't know where she... There were twins and one died and this other one was stolen by somebody working in the hospital where she was and we never found her until she was about 18 years old, right? By which she was somebody else. She was not of us. I still see her. She lives in plannings out there, you know. Um, but she's a different person. And, you know. <clears throat> those, those first nine years, I, I told you, was what I held on for my entire life because my mother used, we didn't have toys. We used to make our own toys. My mother would send us to the canal in front and get mud and we'd mold and make little toys, um, you know, very artistically, coal pot and pot and bowls and plates and so on, which we'd give to our little sisters. And we would go and get ma um, bamboo root and make balls, shape them. If you ever get hit with one of them, you know what pain is, you know what I mean? For cricket balls, you know, and coconut bats and things like that. You know, um, and we developed that knack of, of, of making things with our hands, my brother and I and my sisters and so on. And, 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 and we look forward to the congratulations from my parents and so on about the lovely things they made, you know. And um, we, the stories my father would tell us molded us into creativity and so forth, so as I remember. And I said, I was saying that the, the things that I learned in those first years seem to have lived with me forever. Because when I left high school, I was at, I didn't know what to do, you know. But I, within about three or four months, I got a job at, um, in the laboratory. I was 17 and a half or something. You didn't get a job before 18, but eh, because my father was on the staff and all that, they stuck me in the research laboratory. And there was real a treasure trove of creative, all kinds of things to do. We built all the, the plants, the like catcracker and stripper and reformer and so on, that through which um, new fuel would be processed. So we had to produce some kind of a chart of how it will be treated down there. So we passed it through these. We had to make these plants, model it, operate them, take temperatures, all the thing. And so building them was just heaven, you know. I learned pipe fitting, I learned welding, I learned all kinds of things, you know, elect electrical wiring and all kinds of things. We had to do it to ourselves. There were electricians who would come up and show us and so on, and then they gone, you know. But maintaining the plants and so on, and distilling, you know, um, you could make around there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, um, Angostura once sent down a big drum of something for us to put through our stills, and, you know, so many guys were getting drunk and things. And, you know, I laugh at them because I, I wouldn't, you know. Anyway. Um, in research, I met people like Stokes and Hill. You know Stork? Remember Errol, Stokes and Hill? And, yeah, he, and I take the pride in saying that I encourage him to take up theater. Because he used, you know, you could see a guy got a, a creative gift and so on, you know. But he was fent, bent on being a bhajan. You know what I mean? was stabbing somebody and beating somebody up on Coffee Street and that kind of thing, you know. 
But whenever the um, magazine came around, uh, they would send safety pictures and put a caption to it. Stork was the first one to come out, out of the gate with a, a creative thing, you know. Like there, there was one I remember, there was one a man outside of a, the refinery lighting up a smoke, lighting up a cigarette. And Stork said, I'll be, what do you think of this? Dying for a smoke. <laughs> Good. That's very, very good. He said it, and he won prizes and so on. I said, man, you know. So he used to encourage me to come up to Mount Lambert where his brother lived. His brother was an engineer. And we got in, we fell in with the North Side crowd, party time. You know, girls and going to beaches and stuff, you know. So I encouraged him to join the theater, to get involved in the theater, which he did eventually. But how I got into theater is this. Let me tell you. While, when I, I left school, I wasn't doing anything. And Joyce Curtin, you see, I had to mention a lot of people who, because my life is not just my life. So many people contributed to making, helping me <laughs> create a life. Joyce Curtin is top of that list. She was an older girl than me, by about, I don't know, seven years, I think. For those of you who don't know, Joyce Curtin is a dance yes. icon. You know, everybody knows who Joyce is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she, she's probably about seven years older than I. And she was a friend of my older female cousin. They were friends, Merle, Jean, you know, a different. So she said that she was inviting Beryl McBurney to help her select dancers. To you know who Beryl is, right? <laughs> yes. I know somebody here will tell me, how are I going to know who Beryl is? I wasn't alive when she was alive. Yeah. Like I, that's what people tell me, so I'm going to check. You know she experienced. No, I didn't know Jesus. <laughs> how come you know Jesus? He was alive? Or? So she, um, called, Beryl came down, and in the Anglican youth movement place in next to St. Paul's Cathedral upstairs, we're going to have this audition of young people, hopefuls. So we had people like Stoke the Wages, John Millard, Torrance Mohammed, and so on. You know, people who are still alive. No, no, we are, they're still alive. <laughs> and some of you will know these people. They're retired and so on. And, and myself, of course, we lined up over there. And Beryl said she did some kind of moving across this, this stage and say, okay, do this. Tam, tam, ta tam, 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 tam. And everybody, you did one. Tam, 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 tam. I did it too. And then she said, okay, you will do, you will do, you will do. And she turned to me and said, not you and darling, you try something else. <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of my dancing career. So um, everybody had a good laugh, just like you had. And Joyce, laughingly, came and put her arm around my shoulder and said, don't mind, don't mind that, hey, Ali, we got to try something else. <laughs> so a few, a, few, a few months later, that was the age of starting things, you see. There was nothing. There was nothing. And, and, and Joyce was one of those people who would start things. So she, now she was going to start a drama group. <laughs> and um, when I went, all the in crowd people were inside the house at Mrs. Kathleen Piper's house. You know, Miss Kathleen Piper went on huh? Court Street. You know? She was another social activist. And um, there were so many people in the house we couldn't get in. We stayed out on the road, I think. And then they said next week we will have a, a meeting again to select the executive board. And when I went this time, I could get in the house because there were less people. And they had the executive board, president, blah, 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 secretary, and so on. And then they said, next week, we will read a play and choose and decide to do it. Um, you know, at that time, I went, and there were just about five people. You know, from that whole crowd, over two weeks, thing thinned out just to me. And I got the leading role. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Um, that would be 1953. Yeah. And the play was The Bishop's Candlesticks by Moliere. And I was the prisoner who escaped and stole the people, the pastor, or the priest, or whatever, candlesticks. And um, there was kindness and forgiveness and all that kind of thing. And I was applauded. My father said, um, I told him, well, you had to come and see me. He said, yeah, yeah, he's all right. <laughs> okay. But I, I, I said, and, and, and the company was called Carnegie Players because it was held at the Carnegie uh, Library. And it lasted for, oh, good Lord. The last time I performed with them would be about 1963 when we Moon for the Misbegotten by O'Neill Play that they were doing at San Fernando, mm, that thing called Naprimo Bowl. I got married in 1960. I'm still married to the same person. In 1960, <laughs> and um, as wives tend to be, my wife was ambitious to see her husband move up. So she told me, why don't you apply for this job? Why don't you apply for that? Why don't I applied for a job at a supervisor at um, Unilever, and I got the job. You know, It was paying slightly less than I was making at, um, <laughs> at uh, uh, Texaco, but it had the possibility for upward mobility, you know? So I joined them in 1960. One. Um, and my first son was born six months later, uh, in 62. And um, I stayed with Unilever from 1962 to 1972, 1961 to 1962, somewhere like that. 11 years, I think I counted. But um, I enjoyed working with Unilever. There were people who, you know, respect <laughs> creativity and talent and so on. And they did everything to promote, to give you opportunities for advancement. So much so that in 1969, I was asked to, if I would go to Africa, Kinshasa in Congo, to help them there with some problems and so on. Um, I said, well, there are guys here who know that sting better than I do, <laughs> you know, I mean, um, I, I'm still learning from them, you know, like Hollister Chung, who used to take photographs for us, and Brandon, and so on, guys who I, I met working there, why me, why, you know, I say, well, you got something special that <laughs> they need over there, you know, say, it's your ability to communicate, and your creativity, and so forth, you know. So, because the, the point was that they wanted the, the African, the Congolese, to learn. They, um, Unilever had just recently bought this new factory, and they would like to carry the, the junior operators' um, officers to England. But they spoke only French, or Lingala, or Swahili, or Lu, or Utetila, and so on. You know? So, the thing was to get them to learn to, to speak French, speak English. I spoke French then. I had to speak French. I think I still do. <laughs> um, I had to learn to speak French in about two months. And they gave me um, uh, liguaphone tapes and, and sent me by a lady called Mrs. McLean who spoke French. She was French with me and I, you know, we did those things. And, just, and I arrived there. <laughs> the, um, Immigration officer asked me for my passport, and I didn't know what the hell you were saying, you know. <laughs> so I told my wife, I said, passport, passport, monsieur. Oh, passport. Oh, I see, passport. Yeah. So, I mean, learning, learning French and talking French is two different things, eh? 
Um, it's best to learn it in a place where they spoke French. Because <laughs> my pronunciation was all over the place. So, um, but I learned a lot, a lot of French, a lot of useful French over there. And I go every evening. There were 421 night spots in Kinshasa. Drinking spot, drinking by the call them boats, you know. And, and so I said, well, well, let's see how many 421 we could visit, you know. <laughs> so we'd go out and drink beer. But my job was that of troubleshooter, to find problems that they had with the things and so on as well as to encourage them to learn to speak French, uh, English, as well as to write a report on my whole visit and so on to take back to England. I spent about two weeks in England before I went to another factory and then 12 hours on the plane down to Kinshasa. Um, what in troubleshooting <laughs> is not about knowing the the, the technology is on. Yes, that's useful. But the problems that I found in all of these places were, and at another time sent me to Canada as well to do the same as the troubleshooter, was that the problems are usually man-made. And that there's somebody or bodies there who know the history of the background of the problem and how to solve it. But in Africa especially, the white people, as they were, the, the Belgians, don't listen to the black people who operated all the machines. So I used to go drink with the, with the black guys and find out what it was going on, what's the history of things, you know? Why is um, excess of caustic being put into this batch and they're causing so much loss? And it's just simple. Um, they changed the tank some years ago and they're using the same lipstick. Understand? <laughs> Simpler. <laughs> you yeah, are uh, over saponifying, in other words, uh, that's what they used to call it, converting your fat into soap, which is a, a lower cost thing. So we got that fixed, and I became some kind of hero out there because they wouldn't listen to me. He said, You know how long, I mean, they, they tell me in their language, they, they always, this was the problem. When you went to line with them, they come from five guys, they come from five different tribes. And this one would be talking Swahili, that one would be talking Lingala, that one talking Otetila, and, and all of them know the language. Everybody knows one another language. But for my sake, for the outer courtesy, they would speak French. <laughs> so that I knew, you know. And it was so kind of them. I mean, Congolese were such a nice people. I, this, this is the people that say who are raping nuns, you know. <laughs> I mean, so somebody raped a nun, but... Yeah. I don't know if it was one of us, one could have been one of those Belgian, you know, what I mean? and um, they were in, not involved in any war. Every evening they see, the, uh, they see the, 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 the trucks coming in with bloodied soldiers from the wars up inside and say, well, we are having party here in Kinshasa all the time, you know, no problem. Yeah, so what I'm saying is that I use my creativity <laughs> and my ability to communicate with the people, go and drink with them, talk with them, find out how to solve the problems. And they told me every problem we, 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 that was laid before me and said, you know, I, I wouldn't really burden you with the techno, technical details, but everything. I go and, I go and drink some beer, man, you know. And I did meet guys who would tell me what the problems were, but the Belgians would not listen to the people. <laughs> and blame them for everything, cleaning the drum. A passive thing inside a drum is only muck. You know, the drum's not being properly washed, you know what I mean? So I remodeled the drum machine and procedure. And, you know, everything's all right, you know. And then um, they thought I was getting too close to the Congolese. So they, um, I think they conspired to send me back. <laughs> they came and told me, oh, you know, um, they, Trinidad is asking for you, you know, and they ask me. When I spoke to Trinidad, they said they just inquired <laughs> how long. <laughs> they would keep, when the, you know, they just went, 
He said, yes, because, you know, they have a promotion for you, you know, and blah, 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 blah. So, okay. But by this time, by this time you were um, working, you, you, before that you had made connections with Derek. Oh, yeah. I, well, this came about um, in 61, I tell you, I, I, I moved up north because we were going to leave her. And in 62, we were doing a play by, uh, by, 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 by Barker, I think. With, um, what's that? Rose Slip. Rose Slip. Yeah. Douglas Archibald, yeah. And um, we were doing it on Pembroke Street in the British Council Yard. You know that? You know that British Council Yard there with a the theater? Yeah. So Errol, Errol came. Errol was not in the play, but it was his company, Errol Jones. Um, company of Players. Joel. Well, well, Jones was in it, is what I meant. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're yeah, right. You're right. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was Errol Hill. Because Errol Hill used to come to San Fernando and give us little workshops, and Sidney Hill would come and do workshops, and Jimmy King, who was the drama officer, and, and, and as well as Gene Herbert herself, would come down south to help us, you know. There was such a thing as a drama officer. Drama officer, yes. A thing of the past. I was not going to ask that question. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think that we know the word drama anymore. No. Something called theater arts. We have arts. Yeah. Right. Oh, we've gone up there now. We arts. We are artists. Yeah. <laughs> but they'd come down there, and it was Jimmy King and Errol Hill and people like that who encouraged us. Little hicks down in South who knew nothing about Paul Spain, you know. And encourage us, you know, and, and point out our where we need to improve and so on. And when I came up to town, the Port of Spain, I used to call it town, city. <laughs> um, yeah, we, I went naturally to the company, company of players. And I was cast in this play called um, Road Slip. Eunice, she's not here. She didn't come. Eunice was in it. Phyllis Mitchell was in it. You know her name, eh? Uh, Phyllis Mitchell, I think, was Phyllis Mitchell was the precursor of Eunice, I would say. You know, that kind of actress. And um, Errol Jones said to me, asked me, why don't you come to a workshop? I said, what is that? He said, well, Derek started a thing over at the Caribbean. Why don't you come? So I said, why do come? Thanks for the invitation. I went and um, met Derek Walcott. <laughs> Limpest paw you ever felt when you shook a hand. I don't know why. Maybe he's very protective of his writing hand or something. You know what I mean? But he put out such a limp paw when I shook hands with him. Some, okay, all right. But it was a good, a good match, a good fit. Met Paul Keynes Douglas there for the first time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I remember we were singing a song and walking to it and trying to move and all that kind of thing. And Paul was, you know, that kind of thing, you know. But the, so the workshop, we had workshops for about for three years before anybody got on stage. They were doing, no, they, when I went to the Carib, they were doing, um, they did the lesson. Yes, with, 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 with Joy Dumas. Joy, sorry, Ryan. Joy Ryan, not Gomez. <laughs> Gomez. Yeah. Joy Ryan. And Slade Hopkinson. Joy Gomez and Slade Hopkinson. And I saw Slade, Hop Slade Hopkinson. I saw him in something, a one man thing. Crafts Darcy. That's that Crafts Darcy. Right. Um, and then nothing happened for a while. Because Beryl said that she wanted to have a marriage of the arts. You know, she had this flamboyant marriage of the arts, darling. You know? <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> so Derek would his section would be the drama. Um, Dexter Lindsay would be about stage management, and hers would be the dance. And that started somehow. We we were going down on every Friday, five five o'clock, five Friday to for workshops. And then one day we went and saw Beryl locking up the back gate back gate. So <laughs> said Beryl, what happened going on? Huh? Well, yeah, I had the bangaranga. <laughs> I don't know where we were supposed to hear. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, look, I hear. Look, all the bench, eh? And we had one little bench. <laughs> we used to use it as a prop and to put it outside. <laughs> and, we, and, and so we were put out. And we never knew why. For many years later, I heard it was over, you know, one little thing with these big titans fighting over a little thing about a. Uh, electricity payment of our electricity bill for the Caribbean, you know. I don't know what the details of the quarrel, but it was tendered at a meeting uh, and it ended up in a bus up of the little Carib theatre workshop, gone so. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when it became the Trinidad Theatre workshop. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. We were all over the place. Um, I remember we were once in the, in the, in the Catholic place on, on Coblenz there doing something. We were at the, that thing, the Emperor Valley Zoo Cafeteria, whatever. We were there. And then I think Dr. Lee, yes, somehow got through Margaret, got on to Derek and said, well, his relative owned the Retinol Hotel, and there's this room downstairs, the um, thing. And so we got in there. Boom. <laughs> it was a dark hole. It was a dark step. You got in there, you had to close your eyes before you found the switch to what he liked, you know? And it's dark. But it was a splendid place, a little cocoon in which we could do things. We did. We did, this would be about 1964, we did Albi, Albi's um, the zoo story. We did um, the blacks down there. We did um, Chuinka, um, what's it? The road. Uh, uh, very important, and we became the basement theater. That's what we were called, basement theater. In the moon on a rainbow shawl was rehearsed there, but staged in Queen's Hall, Queen's Hall right? And in 1965, we got for the first time a subvention from government, $500 to do <laughs> the very first time it was ever heard of government giving a theater group money, $500. This was an enormous sum, I promise you. In 1965, and we did Henri Christophe for a thing that was called the Trinidad Festival. Um, apparently, it was being funded by government. You know? you played, you played I played Christophe, yes, and Wilbert played Vashti, and Ralph Campbell played Desaline, and um, who played? You know, that's the first time I saw a play on stage. It was in San Fernando in Presentation College when Ronnie Williams and people like um, How Horace James and so on came to San Fernando to, to play that same play. Um, to do that same play, Henri Christophe, which is a play that Derek wrote when he was 19, I'm told. And he would not change a word. <laughs> you know, 19. But um, it was a wonder, it has towering metaphors in that thing, man, that you could feel grand just seeing them, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go, you know. So that was 65 down in the basement. 